right? 10, 21st, 2015, do you realize today is the future of Back to the Future? Yes. We need no roads where we're going, right? Remember they're supposed to have flying clouds by now? And hovering boards? And jackets that dry themselves up? Shoes that tie themselves? Um, hoverboards and hover devices that can suspend you upside down to stretch your back, right? Um, teleconference is supposed to be a major thing. That's there, right? They're supposed to be holo have holograms? Not so much, right? But we do have 3D printing, which is kind of cool, right? Things that they did not think about. You know you can 3D print a lot of things, like big things. You can 3D print a car if you want, right? There's a 3D printer in a university in California that has 3D printed an actual car. The entire car was printed, all right? That's pretty really crazy, all right? So you can do all kinds of cool things, right? So now if you can imagine it, it can be built because the printer can build it for us, right? And that's pretty cool. We'll be very close. You know on Star Trek, they have something called, uh, they said they call um, replicators. It's a machine that's based on the teleporting, uh, the teleporter technology. So the teleporter technology in Star Trek, you know, they pick you up, they teleport you somewhere else, right? But they figured, okay, so what do you need to do that? By the way, Teleporting is not impossible, okay? There's a, something very cool in quantum physics that's called um, quantum entanglement, right? Which is any two particles that have been connected, once separated, still kind of know about each other. And this, I'm just simplifying because, you know, it's so complicated. But think about it. If I get a particle and another particle and I accelerate them really fast away from each other, and then I do something with this particle. Maybe I oscillate the magnetic field around it, causing the particle to respond to that. Maybe it's a charged particle, so it will respond to that. So the particle is moving through a magnetic field that's perpendicular to it. And then I, I, I oscillate the field. That caused the particle to rotate. The other particle, who did not have a field in it, also rotates for some reason. Right? So it's almost as if whatever happens here instantaneously travels to what I, there. So, you know, and it's, which is really weird because information is not supposed to travel faster than the speed of light. So it's very intriguing. And, it's, and it talks about something about the universe that we're still not, you know, not aware of. Not, we can't control it. We don't know about it. So a lot of these things are premises, the promises for, for future technology. So the idea here is that if you can do that, maybe you can one day. I mean, information is traveling somehow, right, very fast. So, so maybe someday we can do it, right? Um, so either way, the idea is actually more complex. And in uh, teleporters, what do they do? They they get you, they scan you first of all, and then your they scan the molecular structure of you, all the atoms, everything, and then they grab that, put into a computer buffer, and then information travels at the speed of light somewhere else. Actually, it goes through subspace, which is faster, right? And then when it gets to the bottom, it rematerializes you. Now, at first, early technology of teleporter on the Star Wars universe, you have to have a second teleporter somewhere else to rematerialize you. But uh, uh, by now, you, uh, uh, at the time of Kirk, by the time of Kirk already, they can already actually remotely assemble you. So the, the ship's teleporter can, can assemble you at the ground, right? Through a beam, a, a data stream. Now, when it gets to the ground, the basically it rematerializes you, makes a copy of the information that's in the computer, and reassembles the molecular structure exactly as it was before. The problem with that teleporter technology, as it is stated, right, um, speed of light traveling is probably impossible, as we think right now, but what warp travel is promising because it, you can bend space, is the idea. So you don't have to break the speed of light, you don't have to go faster than the speed of light. All you have to do is make the space ahead of the ship shorter, right, and the space behind the ship longer. So if you stretch this and compress that, so it's basically like that. The space is the same, but then I'm getting this and I'm, I'm compressing it, and I'm getting this and I'm stretching it, right? So then it actually looks like that, right? But that space is still 100,000 million light years, and that's just maybe two feet. Are you with me? Except you got the two feet and you stretch it a lot, and you got the 100 million light years and you compressed it a lot. Are you with me? And now all you have to do is take one step, you're already there. So you don't have to go at the speed of light, you're, you're just bending space, right? Now that sounds ridiculous, but gravity does it. Gravity bends space, right? Around the planet Earth, space is bent. Time is bent because of gravity of the planet Earth. Around the sun, uh, when there's a solar eclipse, right? It's possible for the light of the sun for you to see a star that's behind the sun. That shouldn't be possible. 
Star, if we're here on Earth and the sun is here, we shouldn't be able to see behind the sun. But stars behind the sun are visible during the eclipse. So, of course, it needs to be dark for you to see stars during the day, right? But the sun is over there, so that, you know, as that right now I'm looking directly at the projector, but, and I shouldn't be able to see something behind the projector because the projector is on its way. But if I turn off the light of the projector, so that's the eclipse, right? I still shouldn't be able to see something that's behind it, right? But the thing about it is that the gravity of the sun bends light around it, and you can actually see it. It's called gravitational lensing. So it's proof that general relativity by Albert Einstein is actually a thing, that space is bent. Likewise, time is bent. The clocks of GPSs and the clocks of us are taking a different speed for two reasons. One, because the they're traveling very fast, and two, because they're further from the center of the Earth, and therefore gravity is slightly less intense, meaning that gravitational bending is lower up there, which means the time for them takes a little slower. So astronauts that spend in space, they spend less and less time up there than they actually, we think they spent up there, because for them, time goes a little slower. That's legit, less legit real. It's called general relativity. Now, these ideas sound crazy, but if we can bend space, gravity can bend space, so if we can figure out how gravity works, maybe we can do it, right? And then we can bend the space and travel at warp speed. That's crazy. But a teleport technology has a bigger problem. So it doesn't break current physics laws to bend space. Gravity already does it. We just don't know how to do it. But a teleporter breaks a, a very interesting physics law, which is the idea that you can measure everything. Because the teleporter has to determine both the position and the momentum of all the particles in your body in order to know to rematerialize you exactly like you were. Are you with me? All the electrons, all the atoms, all the molecules, everything about them, every single one of them, has to be scanned, right? Not, not to mention, imagine how much data we're talking about here, right? So it has to be a very supercomputer. That's another problem. But that's just computer technology. We'll get there someday. But there's a bigger problem. There is no such thing as being able to measure both the position and the movement at the same time precisely. We'll learn about that at the end of the year. It's called Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. You can't measure both the momentum and the position or both the energy uh, uh, and, um, and the position of, of a particle. So that means it's impossible to do a teleporter, perhaps, because we can't do that. But let's say we could f find a way to break that rule. And we could, but that's a rule on the gravity. Just like we don't, can't travel faster than the speed of light, maybe we can break that and do the Star Wars thing one day where they have to travel faster than the speed of light with a hyperdrive, right? Not a warp drive, a hyperdrive. Who knows? Maybe we can break that rule. Maybe we can break the rule of... Um, by the way, it's a, it's a, there's a theory about how we could break that rule. The reason uh, things can travel at the speed of light, they just can't have mass to do it. The photon is a particle without mass, and it doesn't. Uh, neutrino, that's very, very light, almost doesn't have mass, goes at 99.9% .9 the speed of light, right? So if you take all the mass out, so all we have to do is either negate the mass that we have, or find a way to make our mass not count temporarily, and then we can do it. Are you with me? So if we can detach us from the Higgs boson or create a bubble, all right, and in that bubble, the Higgs boson doesn't apply. But inside the bubble it does, outside the bubble it doesn't. Are you with me? And so the bubble will travel through space at the speed of light and that'll be fine. But the amount of energy we're talking about is almost infinite, and that's what the problem is. You know what I'm saying? To, to create that bubble. So there's theories about that. But anyway, it's back to the teleporter. I am going in tangents. So teleporter is impossible because of that. But if it was possible, it would be a really cool thing to do. Right? Now, the, the, the time traveling from back to the future is, is more complex because maybe we could go to the future. Maybe we can bend the universe space and time enough to actually see what's yet to come. Going to the past creates a problem because when you go to the past, you affect the future. And everything you do to the past changes the future. And therefore, you can't go to the past because if you go to the past, your, the future from which you came from no longer exists because the fact you went to the past changed that, right? Are you with me? I'm saying. So it's actually impossible then to do that. So the, the idea is maybe we can't travel to the past, but maybe we can uh, time traveling is a kind of like jumping universes, right? You go to the past, and then when you go to that, you go to a different timeline where you went to the past. And therefore, or maybe there's a more complex idea, which is that if someone can time travel, it already happened. In other words, someone already did go to the past, which means this present that we're living is the present that's based on the past where already somebody already did that. Are you with me? So it's a causality principle error that happens in science. 
because time travel causes a breakage to the causality principle. What causes what? You know, it's theoretically even possible to be your own father if you want, if you, went, you could back to go back to the past, right? And imagine how many, all kinds of weird things. So these paradoxes of time travel are very interesting, which is why movies about time traveling are super interesting to think about. And Back to the Future is a very fun one. Lots of time errors and loops and things like that, that you can talk about with Back to the Future. Um, but it's a really cool movie. But it, I, I like that if you haven't seen it, it's actually fun. All right. So really, even though it's an older movie right now, it's like 30 years old, it's pretty, it holds itself pretty well. You know, of course, the future of Back to the Future is now in our past, so perhaps it doesn't have that kind of same allure, right? But you can still think of yourself as, as a person in the 80s looking at the, at the 30 years in the future and imagine what that would be like. And in fact, it still holds true because a lot of the things that they are talking about in the future are still futuristic. You know, and they still haven't happened. So it's pretty fun to look at. Um, but anyways, um, we have to talk about dynamic swing. Let's get back, back to the present, all right? It was, it's fun to think about the future, though. In Star Trek, for example, they have this device that Captain Kirk uses to communicate, where they, he flips up and talks to the ship. Right? We already went through that. It's called a flip hole, and we now it's like what, like an outdated thing. <laughs> now what we want is a device that's like, like a computer in our hands. They have that too. It's called a tripoder. It's like actually, uh, it, it can actually scan things. It's a very good scanning device as well. You know what I'm saying? Right now, we have lots of sensors in our phones, right? We have a camera, we have bar barometer, temp thermometer. You know phones have all that, right? Yeah, uh, eventually, we'll have more scanners. Eventually, we'll have, there's electromagnetic field scanning on it. Eventually, we can have more kinds of things. You know you can get your phone and um, it has an IR, or at least this mine does, as an IR thing on it. So I can actually point to the back of the room. There's an app that can shoot the IR and then detect the IR back, and I can tell how far I am from the back of the room. Now imagine doing that and doing this, and I can actually scan, the, one day I can scan the room. It, it will happen. The tripod of Star Trek, it's coming. You know what I'm saying? But we also use it as far as a communication device. As far as communication goes, why do we need the phone, right? Why not just have something that we can have? You don't have those watches now? That can be a thing. Someday it will just be like Star Trek The Next Generation. A little, they just hit a little communicator here, right? And then it talks, it, it, it talks to people. But back to what I started talking about the future, is the idea of the teleporter technology. The teleport technology creates matter from data. How do they do that? They get energy, and it, because energy and matter are the same thing, E equals mc squared, correct? So that means what the teleporter does is it consumes energy from the ship, from the ship's reactor, right? Which, by the way, is a fusion reactor. It, in, the, in the reactor of the ship, it's like they're doing the same thing that happens inside the sun. You know what I'm saying? That's how the ship works. So they get the energy from the fusion reaction to actually convert that energy to matter and therefore materialize things. The interesting thing about the teleporter is that if you're capable of scanning someone and then rematerializing the person, scanning that person, right, converting that person to data, and then sending an energy stream to somewhere else, and then using that, that energy, back, you, and processing the data and converting back to matter, of course we have a problem of measuring there, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, but if you can get over that, you, you could also not just teleport, you can copy. Are you with me? I'm saying, because it's, on the teleporter, the person dematerializes. But if, what if you don't? What if you just scan the person, and it makes another one? It would be a way to clone yourself. Are you with me? I'm saying, uh, it's, which is interesting. But what a teleporter does, once they realize, okay, so we can do that, why not just? And it became illegal in Star Trek the universe to do that, to not dematerialize a person, and you know what I'm saying for other reasons. But it became illegal. But the. Uh, the cool thing about about this is that this it can also be scanned. There's a, there's a matter pattern on this, an energy organization pattern that, that we call cell phone, right? Where molecules are all related to each other and configured in a way that you can have this device, right? But if I can read that that data, I can just put it on a machine and make another one, and another one, and another one. So it's like much better than 3D printing, right? You can just make unlimited copies of the cell phone, right? And then I can just save that pattern on the computer. So every time I need a cell phone, I just print one. Right? That's called a replicator. And they use that to make food. They use that to make devices. But of course, it, it consumes energy because you, you're creating matter from energy. Right? So you have to have a very powerful reactor, which the ships do, in order to have that. Right? And of course, it consumes the energy of the ship, so they have to refuel. If it, so it's not like you're getting energy out of nowhere. And they're just getting phones out of nowhere. They're using the energy of the reactor to do that. Right? But because it... 
one day we'll be able to convert energy to matter like that. Why not? So what the things we think are the future are the things that inspire us to think about the present and push the limits of the present. You know what I'm trying to say? Which is why it's fun to think about the future. It's fun to think about the future in that sense because did I tell you guys about the, the line of knowledge and the line of imagination? Did I ever tell you guys about this? Imagine that you're in the 1600s and you tell someone from the 1600s that we've been to the moon. Would they think, would they believe you? You think. No. But even in the 1800s, there was a scientist, uh, 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 author, famous author called Jules Verne, that they wrote a book about a rocket, something that launches and goes into the moon. Are you with me? And isn't that what we did? So that was Jules Verne's imagination that became reality someday. People that dreamed of flying, and now we do, right? On airplanes, yes, but maybe one, one day we'll, we'll figure out how gravity works and undo it, and we'll have anti-gravitational devices, and we can just hover around like the Jetsons, right? Now, what I'm saying here is that the line of knowledge, as we as a society keep learning, the, the line of knowledge keeps being pushed forward. Right? The things we know that we can do, and the techno by the way, the, tech the things we can do are based on technology, but technology is based on what we know. But the more technology that we have, the more we can study, the more we can know. And so therefore, the line of knowledge keeps being pushed forward. Are you with me? And beyond the line of knowledge, the rise of the realm of imagination. The things we don't know yet, or we can't do yet, but that we imagine. But if history has taught us anything, is that the line of knowledge catches up with the line of imagination sometimes. Are you with me? And what used to imagine it's possible, or godly, is one day, not a miracle, not imagination, but something of our daily lives. Imagine telling someone from the Middle Ages that you, that you picked up someone's heart from their chest, switched with somebody else's heart that was dying, and made that other person stay alive. That's freaking witchcraft, that's what that is. <laughs> All right? Or imagine that you can go to us, to to like uh, three years ago, I had cancer, right? And I went to a table, and I sat on a table, and a machine whizzed around a little bit, and I, got, I walked out of the machine without cancer. That's called a gamma ray thing, right? The gamma ray knife burned my cancer without ever opening me up. It's called radiation therapy, right? So literally, I went to the machine that cured me. That's like, that's like freaking Jesus. You got touched by something, and you're, and you're healed. He's using energy to heal you, isn't it? So miracles... Unexplained mysteries, magic, is just us getting better at knowledge and technology. But it's a vicious cycle. The more we know, the more we can find out. And eventually, what we thought about imagination catches up. But you see, that quest for knowledge is pushed by imagination. Imagination is the horse that pulls the carriage. Are you with me? So it's more, it's more important than knowledge then. And that's what Einstein says. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Are you with me? And I feel that this is an infinite journey. That we're never going to get to the end of it. The more we learn, the more we realize there is to learn. So it's like, as the line of knowledge gets longer and longer, we realize that the end of the line is further and further. And it's exponential. So if we take two steps forward, we realize the dial of knowledge ends four steps from there. So let's take four steps forward. We realize there's 16 steps to go. Are you with me? So the more we're learning, the more we're seeing the line stretching to infinity. And imagination trying to catch up, but not quite. And we, throughout history, have called that end on infinity God. Miracles. Right? Right? Or, and my point is, what used to be called infinity, or something really far away, impossible, godly, we've gotten there in so many different ways. Are you with me? So if you ask a Greek person, and you came today with this device, and you could still do what it does, take a picture of the person, they would call you a god on the spot. Are you with me? How do you do it? How do you capture the person's soul? Right? That's incredible. You know, or you get a machine that makes fire, like a laser that makes light. Imagine, you would be a god among men. If you could go back to the past and do it, right? So, maybe one day, teleporting, creating life, all of that is just at infinity. That seems to be infinitely far away. But we'll get there someday, and we'll look back and be like, oh, 
we went so far, but then we also realized what? We still have even more to go. And so when you ask me, what is God? God is that infinite point that we're never getting to. All right? If there is an actual point that we're never getting to because it's an infinite track. Are you with me? So where we think is God right now, it's not God. That's just the future. But there is a point, since it's an infinite track, there, infinitely far away, that we're never going to get to. And that's what divinity is. Are you with me? But it's interesting how humanity is a search for that. Humanity is in the search for the divine, the beyond, asking questions. And that's what science is all about. You know? So, and the interesting part is that this is not something scientists believe in. This is something scientists do. Scientists want to know things, right? They want to push the limits of knowledge. But we also believe in things. We believe in each other. We believe in the process. We believe. I think belief, faith is important for love, for society, for these things. But scientists don't believe. They question everything. Einstein one day questioned that gravity was things falling in a straight line towards the floor. He said, no, it's not like that. It's a bending of the space-time continuum. And now we know that that's wrong too. And so even something as held truth and sacred as things fall can be challenged. You do not know the power of the dark side. Right? <laughs> everything can be questioned. Even everything you think is true could be lies. And everything that we don't know yet, so somebody tells us something new, question that as well. That skeptic mentality is what keeps pushing science forward. Right? And it's funny because science keeps changing. And yet we can trust it. Because the future, or the past has shown you that science continues to change. And yet, what we currently know is based on lots of research done by many scientists all at once, right, independently from each other, arriving at the same conclusions, and modifying that through peer review, look, looking at each other's work. So what we have is a lie, but it's the best lie we have. Unlike somebody else's lie that's based on nothing. Are you with me? So if you ask somebody 300 years ago how to help someone fight a disease, they will get the best truth they had. But that's not the truth. This is what I like about science. There's no truths. There's only the best we got. Right? And so perfection is not a perfection, divinity, magic. Success is not a position. It's a vector. Are you with me? It's a direction in which you're going. It's, it's, it's actually not a scalar. It's a direction. Right? And your success then is not where you are, but where you headed and how fast you're going there. Well, success is more like velocity than position. I really what I'm trying to say. So think about that and think about where you headed. Right? Now, it is interesting to think about the future, but it's more useful to live in the moment and do the best we can every moment. As long as you always try to be your best every moment, that future is always going to be a better one. You know? Even if it doesn't work out for you. All right? I, 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 that's something I believe, I believe in. I believe that trying your best builds that future for you. And it just happens. But I also believe that life is not easy. And it's never going to be. That these dreams we have, that things will be good. Because if we look about futuristic things, that's what I like about Back to the Future. It's not perfect. In fact, he goes to the future to fix it. Right? To save Marty's children. Right? The future is not perfect. In the future, things are still flawed. Right? Nothing is perfect. The future, is, perfection is not a point. You're always going to have, you're always going to need to push the line forward. Right? So it's not a perfection. Success is not about what the, this place you're going to finally get to. Happiness. It's not about getting everything you wanted. It's not about that. It's about the chase. You know? It's about the chase. It's about going at 88 miles an hour and then some sh deep shit's going to happen. Oh, it's not shit. That's what the body would say. All right, so let's talk about finished dynamics. So, help me out because I already talked too much. We, we left off from where? Three. So let's finish these. They're very easy, so we can do them really quick. What is the difference between force and net force? So, Jennifer, can you help me out with that? What's net force? Very good. Very good. Give it two, two labels. So force is just each force that you're doing. Net force is the sum of all the forces acting on you. 
So for example, are there forces acting on me right now? Give me one. Gravity. But I'm not falling. Because of normal forces pushing up. Right? So you already did the chapter, you know about that. So force there so is there a net force acting on me right now? A net force. Okay, it depends on which context you look at. But in the context of this room, am I changing my 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 pattern of motion? Right, we're spread to the floor. No. Which is, what does that mean? Now, if you want to realize that I'm going around, spinning around the Earth, right? The Earth is spinning, and I'm spinning with it. Is there a net force acting on me? Yeah, some sort of centripetal force pulling pulling me towards the center of the Earth is causing the thing to, it's causing me to rotate. By the way, it is the why am I rotating with the Earth? Think about that. It what force is acting on me that's causing me to rotate? Not, because I changed the perspective now, right? In the perspective of the classroom, I was what? No net force. But in the perspective of the world, there's got to be a net force because I'm rotating, right? I'm, I'm, the earth is moving and we're moving with it. But the earth is rotating. I'm not. So why am I rotating? We are all sitting in a big globe, aren't we? And this globe is spinning. We are not spinning. The globe is spinning. So according to inertia, we talked about last class, what should we be doing? Now, the earth should be moving and we should be what? We're dancing with it. Hold on a second. I'm going to show you. This, is, this requires a visual. Uh, can you get can, can top of a stool and pick up the globe? And, and uh, just get the whole basket up there. Get the basket. You get a goofy and a globe. All right? Don't fall. Or you can't really fall. All you can do really is, is roll down the gravity hill. Give that to me. All right? And then keep it going. All right? So, we are like Goofy sitting in the globe. Now, I'm making us really big, right? I'm making us really big. But if the Earth is spinning, and we're not, we are not the Earth. We're on the Earth, or we're not on the, the Earth. What happens? We should stay where we are as the world spins behind us. So, I spin it, right? It's, it's not falling. It's falling because I moved the globe. So, I'll do it again. Hold it there. So if I move the globe, he falls with it, right? But, but if I move the globe here, and he's not attached to it, he's going to try to stay where he is, right? So if I you know, hold it really quick, uh -huh. yeah, just put him quick. Right, so I'm going to move the globe away, right? So he stayed where he was until, of course, gravity started acting on, and he felt went down. But he didn't come with the Earth as the Earth moved. That's us. The Earth is spinning. The Earth is going around the sun. Let's think about that. So we are going around the sun. The Earth is going around the sun. We're not going around the sun. The Earth is. Well, we are actually going around the sun. The sun is pulling on us, and we're pulling on the sun. So we actually, if you were at part, at part if you were not on the Earth, if you were not in outer space, would you orbit the sun? Yes, you would. You would orbit the sun, right? So you would be a little thing orbiting around the sun. Of course, you'd more, more likely you would not fall towards the Earth because you were near the planetary system of the Earth, right? But you are also falling towards the sun too, right? And orbiting that. So you individually is or are orbiting the sun. In fact, you celebrate it every year. Every year you celebrate going around it once. That's what your birthday is, honestly. If you really think about it, what is a birthday? It's really one revolution. All right? So you're celebrating, you're celebrating a revolution. All right? So, so that next time you have a birthday, it's a revolution! Woo! Right? So, so uh, but anyways, um, so we're, we're all rebels, right? We're evolving all the time. Revolution. Now, what I'm saying, though, why, according to this thing, we should be staying the way we are. But why do we go with the Earth as the Earth spins? There's got to be a force acting on us, dragging us along. What force is acting on us? Guys, think about it. Just think about it in context of this thing. Can I borrow this little thing? This is perfect. All right? There we are, in the surface. All right? Hard to put it. You gotta find something that, that has more. Hold on. There you go. The sticky nose is actually not a bad idea. People have in intelligence. All right. So now the sticky note is going with it. Why is it going with it? Friction. So the Earth is spinning quite fast. In fact, you know this this thing here is over forty-eight thousand kilometers around the equator. So in one day, you cover 48,000 kilometers. You're going really fast, like really fast. 
48,000 kilometers in a day? That's really fast. You're going at that speed. Why? Friction, right? Friction is holding you to the ground. If you could jump and hover, the air would go over under your feet and you wouldn't go with it, right? When you go on a plane and you travel all the way to, to, to Japan, that matters. So that's why they fly a certain way, not another. You want to fly against the earth, not, 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 for example, if I want to go this way, it doesn't make sense to fly that way because the earth will help me out if I fly this way. Are you with me? It's like save on gas, save on this, save on time because the earth will do some of the traveling for me. Are you with me? So if I'm going to the other side of the world, I'm not going to go in the same direction the earth is spinning, right? Because even as I go, the earth is spinning under my feet. It's going to take forever to get there. It makes more sense to do what? Spin against the earth, right? So, go, so the factors add up. And the relative velocity is bigger. Are you with me? I'm trying to say. Now, so the plane shows that, right? The plane shows that. Now, of course, even when you jump, it seems when I jump, because the earth moves under my feet right now. Yeah, but not very significantly. But because that's the whole thing we did with the little car. If you throw it up, I have the velocity of the earth right now, don't I? Yeah. So even if I jump, I'm still going at that velocity, unless something slows me down. Are you with me? And nothing's going to slow me down because the air is also going at that velocity. It's us, the atmosphere, everything is going at that velocity around. Isn't this thing? Physics makes you think about things you never think about before, and that's why it's cool. But anyways, net force. Net force is the total force acting on something. Is there a net force acting on me with the context of this room? No, right? But when I put it around into the world, there's got to be a force that's making me spin, a centripetal force of some sort. And uh, right? So friction would be that case. Now, explain how inertia depends on a frame of reference. I love that. I love that. We just talked about it. All right? So it'll be an easy one. So um, Giovanni? Where are you? Okay, so give me an ex So inertia depends on the frame of reference. Am I in an inertial state right now? No. Why? Because. Is that a force acting on me? No. No net force in this context. So I'm in an inertial state. Unless I look at, I'm on the moon looking at the earth. Now it's what? I'm spinning. Are you with me? I'm trying to say. So is, is, there, is, is it being on equilibrium? Right? It's, it's dependent on the frame of reference. Are you with me? So what is an inertial frame of reference? An inertial frame of reference is a frame of reference that's not accelerating. So if you're looking from an object, you stopped. Are you with me? So imagine the solar system is here, and we go out of space, and we go to a point, and we stay at that point, not orbiting the sun, not orbiting the earth. Are you with me? That point is stable in space. So. We go outside the Earth, as we're looking at the Earth, and we're completely stationary, not accelerated, right? We would see the Earth spinning and going around the Sun. We are not going around the Sun, though, because we are stationary, we're not accelerating. That would be an example of a non inertial frame of reference, would it? But that point is in a space that's going around the center of the galaxy. So you would have to not be rotating around the galaxy either, and we stay right there. Are you with me? And then galaxies rotate other, around the other galaxies. So you would also have to be stable related to that. And then the universe expands faster and faster. So you would also have to be stable. There is no such thing as an inertia frame of reference in reality. Even if you're sitting at the edge of the universe, looking at the universe from the outside, that edge is expanding faster and faster. Are you with me? So all places in the universe are accelerated, which causes a problem for Newton's laws. Because Newton's laws only work from an inertial frame of reference. Remember we talked about the whole car thing, why the bubble thing seems to be moving when we know it's not? That's because you're accelerating, so you're breaking the law, or the law seems to be broken because the law says an object cannot move unless the force acts on it. But you see the bubbling starting to move, the bubbling head inside the car, right? But you're not breaking, you're not, there's no force acting on it, so how can you be doing it? It's because the force is acting on you, and you are accelerating, right? So you're breaking the rule. Are you with me what I'm saying? If you, the frame of reference, is accelerating, the laws don't work for you. Are you with me? But there's always acceleration, so it's really hard. So this is why Einstein started thinking about this and said, okay, it's complicated uh, to make things relative and to make things matter. But we always approximate. So in the context of this room, right, I'm stationary to other things that which could be accelerated. So when I do that and then accelerate it, I am not 
with, with a relative to that. Are you with me? And so then I can talk about that. So an inertial frame of reference is a frame of reference that with respect to that frame is not accelerating. And that's what you have to be standing to look at the problem for the loss to make sense. If you are accelerating and you are the frame of reference, the laws won't make sense to you. Things will be moving with nothing going to happen to them. Because it's, it's about relative velocity. If I'm accelerating, it will look to me as everything else is accelerating, even though they're not. So the bodily head is accelerating, not because it's accelerating, but because what? I am. Right? Is that clear? So, but if I am not accelerating and other things are moving, then it must be that what? Something must what? Guys, pay attention. You pay attention with your eyes. This is why I don't want anybody sitting on the inside. If there's only sit on the inside, if there's no room on the outside. All right? You can't be facing away from me. Sit on the inside. Now. Move. All right? So, what was I saying? That if anything is changing its pattern of motion according to the circuit law, what does that mean? It must be what? Yeah. Why is it accelerating according to the second law? A force must be acting on it. So anytime you see something changing its pattern of motion, it could only mean one thing. Either you are accelerating and you're not in an inertial frame of reference. Are you with me? Or the other thing has a force acting on it. So it's either acting on you or it's acting on the other thing. But either way, there's a force somewhere. Are you with me? But if you know I'm in an inertial frame of reference, I am not accelerating, at least in the context of the problem. Then the other thing is accelerating, that must mean what? A force is acting on it. What if it's not accelerating? What does that mean? What does that mean about forces, though? Uh, I was waiting for that. You said it means that there's no force acting on it. Is that true? Is there a force? Am I accelerating the context of this room? There's no net force acting on it. What you say matters, you see? Because if you said there's no force acting on me right now, is that correct? No. So could there be a force acting on you and you not be accelerated? How? I don't, how can you, how can there be a force acting on me and I'm not accelerated? Something else is negating that force. So that there's no net force. Very good. All right, so let's move on. Okay. Why does it hurt more to fall from a certain height to the ground than it does to fall from the same height into a swimming pool. So let's talk about that little by little. So I'm asking you a question first, all right? Let's think about what pain is. What are you feeling when you feel the pain? You're feeling the, the what that acts on you? When this, when I feel the pain after a punch, I'm feeling the force. I'm feeling the force. What much force? The, what is force? How do I calculate it? Her. What is force? Mass and acceleration. And remember, this is the pain I feel. The mass times the acceleration. So now let's think about hitting the floor versus hitting the water. So I get uh, the same volume of floor and the same volume of water. Are you with me? In those two situations, in that volume, which one will have more mass, Justin? Great. Demand your labels if you participate. Yes? The floor. So, so think about, we're comparing here water versus the ground. On the water, mass is going to be smaller than the ground for the same volume because the density of the ground is bigger. Does that make sense? Yeah. Then, let's think about acceleration. All right? When I hit the floor, how much time do I have to de decelerate? How quickly do I decelerate when I hit the floor? A split second. It's not instantaneous. It's not instantaneous, but it will happen quickly. Do you know why cars are designed to crinkle up when they get hit? So that the collision lasts longer. Are you with me? By crinkling up, it takes longer for you to stop. Are you with me? That's the same thing about the airbag. We don't, we're going to talk about momentum soon, and you're going to see that that matters. So if you increase the time, you, you, what are you doing to the acceleration? Think about it. Acceleration is what? Change of velocity over time. So if I make this number bigger, what do I do to that number? Smaller. smaller, right? So in the ground, I make that number smaller, which makes the acceleration what? No, I make this number smaller. Which then is that number? Bigger. So the ground has more acceleration too. 
right? It has more. Then, because on the water, this the, the deceleration is smaller, isn't it? Are you with me? Because that happens over a bigger distance and over a bigger period of time. Is that, is that clear for everybody? So when you hit the water, you hit last mass, and you hit what? Last acceleration. Which means what about the force of hitting the water versus hitting the ground? It's going to be less. Does that make sense? All right, so you can just jump from 2,000 feet and hit the water and be fine. No, because at that point, you have, your velocity of impact is so high that even at hitting the water, the force will be tremendous and you will die from the impact. You don't die because... It is your you, destiny. Is your destiny to die? <laughs> right? It is, though. Yes, you have a question. So, yes. Guys, make sure you write the answers. Yes. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be the same as you're falling for a long amount of time with increased velocity? Right. You're going down, so it's increasing, and the time is set already. Right. Exactly. Yes. So it, after a certain height, it doesn't matter. It's like hitting a brick wall. They would be the same thing. Because you're going so fast when you hit the water that you, 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 you're going to hit too fast. Right? That it, it, even the water's cushioning won't be enough to slow you down. You know what I'm saying? But if you're falling from 20 feet and jumping into a pool, right, that's deep enough that you're not going to hit the bottom, right, fast enough, you'll be fine, right? People do it all the time in their competitions and stuff, right? But if I wouldn't jump 20 feet like this into the ground. I would. Right? <laughs> uh, you, you would after a test in Mr. Lima's class, right? You're like, ah! Leave aside. Yes. Yes. Leave aside is the is the act of committing great suicide after taking a was that not actual suicide. By the way, let me tell you something. Since it's on the topic, and we're talking about the future, another thing that I've learned is life life is always tough. It doesn't get easier, and when you get better, the challenges increase, so it always gets harder. So the truth of it is, life sucks. Yeah. <laughs> so what's yeah. the point of it then? Why not just end it and get over with it? Right? Yeah. Uh, sometimes we feel so sad in those moments, man. Sometimes it's hard. I don't know if any of you guys are there now, or you're going through there, or have gone through there. But it's very common to that in teenage years, or even throughout your life, to go through there. In fact, I don't know if you know, notice about the Japanese culture, when people get older, you know, until recently, there's a lot of suicide among all people in Japan. It's because culturally they think that once they become a burden, they're not doing anything positive for society, they might as well just end their life. Like seriously. So a lot of them do this thing, it's a culture suicide kind of thing. So, uh, but, but there's a point to life. There's something that, even though it always gets harder, remember that it's about growth. And the thing about getting harder is that that's awesome. Because the harder it is, the more opportunity to grow. Everything I'm trying to say, the harder it is, the more opportunity to grow. And just think about that, all right? It actually makes sense. Nobody made it, that's what she said, Joe, but it actually makes sense. <laughs> I right? said it in my mind, I said it in my Raina mind. was like, I got this, all right? The harder it is, the more it grows, yes. <laughs> Yeah, in a way, you're hitting last things, right? You could think about that. I like what you said. You should, you should write, guys should write that down too. Now, but I was thinking more of a second law explanation. This, by the way, this is a second. This is a first law question, all right? About in what situation is it really known that force acting on it, right? This is a second question. All right, let's do a third law question then. All right, an astronaut. Hold on, I have to move on. We're running out of time. An astronaut is a space capsule. And he's experiencing weightlessness. So I don't feel heavy. Right? Look what I put weightlessness in parentheses. That's, I'm trying to say something there. Does the astronaut have to exert any effort to throw a ball? Since the ball is also weightless. So what I'm trying to say is, here's the thing. I'm in space. I'm the astronaut. And I'm sure Phil is about this, but... I, every time I'm teaching, I always know there's so many better ways of doing this, but unfortunately, some perhaps hurts me. I should have prepared a video about this and all kinds of things, and they, they show you actually this. But you can use your imagination, and that's more important than knowledge, right? <laughs> so imagine we're in space, and we're all hovering, and I have a ball. Do a, the ball has no weight, or actually, don't say that. We'll talk about why you should say that in a second. But I feel like I have no weight, 
And a boat, certainly in the same situation. So, do I need to, ex to do any effort to throw the ball? Labarda, what do you think? Um, yeah. Why? What law would be broken if I, if, that, if I could just throw the ball with no effort? The first law, it would be an acceleration without force. It's actually the second law, think about it. Because there would be an acceleration without force. Because is the, relative to me, the object is stable right now. But then I push it, it accelerates. It's accelerating. For it to be accelerating, there must be a force. Are you with me? Right? Now let's think about this. I'm getting ahead of, it, of myself, but when the question comes, we'll go through it quicker. All right? If I throw the ball, by the third law, what does the ball do to me? It throws me to you. Since I'm weightless and not in a friction place, right? What happens to me if I throw the ball? I get thrown the other way. Now, the ball will seem as if it would travel faster than I did. Why? What did you say? I am being pushed back, but I'm saying that it will seem as if the ball was pushed further and faster than I was. Why? Yes. Inertia. The ball has less inertia than I do. Second law. Therefore, when the same force applied to me and the ball, who goes first? The ball. The ball. Or faster, right? The ball goes first and faster because it has less mass to, to, to resist the force. Are you with me what I'm trying to say? Meaning, when the moon orbits the Earth, we talked about this again in the last class, it seems as if the moon is orbiting the Earth, not both together the way we talked about in the last class. But why? Because the moon's mass relative to the Earth is what? Smaller, so it seems as if it moves more. But they're both orbiting each other. Are you with me? So when I'm pushing, when I walk, how can I possibly walk? What is this my foot doing to the ground right now? Pushes the ground that way. So why am I walking? Because I walk, the ground pushes me back. So this means I'm putting friction on the ground, which means the ground is putting. But if that's true, when I'm moving this way, what's happening to the ground? It's moving the other way. But why doesn't it seem like it's moving? Because it has such a big inertia. Are you with me? That I can't push the earth. Right? You can tap it. Every time you take a step, it pushes the earth a little bit. Right? Of course, people are taking steps in different directions every time it hits itself. Are you with me? And the math is so big that it don't really affect acceleration, but technically you're doing that. And there's more complicated things because actually, after you put, you, after, even as you're walking, you push against the air, but in the air, push against the other air. There's all kinds of cascade effects of force. But the interesting thing is there's always another force. Forces are never alone. And this is really hard for you to understand sometimes. Look at this one. Because where's the act? Find the paired force, right? So, am I acting on the ball? No. So there's a pair of force acting back. Normal force is always easy to see. Always easy to see, right? Find a pair of force here. I am orbiting the sun. What's the pair of force there? The sun orbits me, right? I'm pulling the sun too. Are you, are you with me? Find a pair of force. I am lifting this. Which means I'm, at, I'm putting a force on it. Where is the, where is the other force? The ball pushes back on my hand, and I can feel it. The weight of the ball on my hand. Are you with me? I'm trying to say. Now, what about when I'm pulling the ball? I can't do it because I'm not, you know, LeBron James. But, you know, if I pick this up and I, I drag it up, so I'm pulling the weight up of the ball. The, ball, the ball's weight is acting on me, right? So, where is the reaction force? You, no, that's the way this after feeling. Where is the reaction force pointing up? Yeah, All right, I'll do it like this. Okay? So, there's weight pushing down, right? And where is the reaction force of the weight there? Right now. Where is the reaction force of the weight? What, what is the force? Give me the name of the force. No, rabbit was pulling him down. You call it going a lift? It's not really a lift. I'm not lifting it. It's friction, yes. Right? My hand's friction is holding that up. Are you with me? And of course, to do that, my arm is pulling a force on the thing, which means this put a thing on the thing in my arm. That's why I feel it here after a while. Are you with me? There's always a net force. Okay, moving on to the next one then. All right? If an astronaut run out of jet, jet fuel, all right, what can he do to propel himself? So, I'm trying to get to the ship. Have you seen Gravity, the movie? Yeah. So, so full of bullshit. Terrible movies. All right, 
so so much bad physics there. Like seriously, the whole freaking thing explodes into tiny little bits, and her ship gets through there without a scratch. That's like ridiculous. But anyways, uh, also a lot of there's a scene that she she can't hold on to the thing. And this is the craziest scene I've seen in my entire life. So like she 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 there's like a rope, right, that they're holding on to, and then George Clooney in the movie. Um, they're trying to stop themselves after the thing. And then she holds on to the edge of the thing with her hands. And then he, he's tied to her with a, with a rope. Are you with me? And so she holds on. She can hold herself. And then the rope starts to turn sl from slack to, to, to tension, right? And then it gets to full tension, right? And then she can barely hold on anymore, right? And therefore, he has to cut himself loose, otherwise she won't be able to hold on anymore. Are you with me what I'm trying to say? The thing is though, if she already stopped it, this is the interesting thing. There's, the thing is not spinning, if no force is acting on, what's pushing him back? That's the weird, really weird thing. There's no force pushing him back anymore. She already stopped it. It's already to have tension. Are you with me? So if anything, there's a force acting back, tension. So the moment he stopped it like this, and tension pulled it back, what will happen to him? He will start coming this way. Like actually come towards her, without her having to pull him. <laughs> Are you with me? I, I was really confused in the movie, what the fuck is pulling him back? <laughs> Are you with me, I'm trying to say? It's not, now, if the whole thing was Spain, if the, I mean, if the whole thing was Spain, if, if the whole thing was Spain, if the whole thing was Spain that the centripetal force on him would be doing the centripetal force on her, and it kind of makes sense that uh, it's about, when we we'll talk about rotation, the third law gets complicated rotation, people get confused with that, but I'll save that for that talk, all right? But let's just talk about this right now. It wasn't, it wasn't spinning or anything, it was just like they, they used a the jetpack to get back to the ship, from one ship to the other, are you with me? And then they ran out of the fuel, and now there's nothing to stop it, they're just going with their, their momentum, right? And then she grabs onto the thing and is able to stop herself. So she's no longer going to be pushed back. There's nothing pushing her back. The moment she stopped, there's nothing her pulling her anymore. So if she was strong enough to hold onto the thing and stop her momentum, she's not being pulled back anymore, right? But the rope is tied to her, right? And then in a second, the second it becomes taut, she's going to feel the tension that's pulling on her. The same tension that would immediately pull on him, bringing him close to her, right? But she was able to withstand that tension with her force of her thing. Therefore, there's nothing pulling her that way anymore. Nothing is pulling him. If anything, it's going to what? Come back. And I couldn't understand. So that's things like that. There's an activity that we're going to do soon where you're going to have to find mistakes in the movies, physics mistakes in the movies, and do a video about it. All right? Things like that is what we're talking about here. But look at this one. I'm out of fuel, and I need to go, by the way, if I'm out of fuel and I already started, I'm going to keep going, right? So he doesn't need to do anything to propel himself. He's already going. He's in space. Nothing's going to stop him. He's going to keep doing what he's doing. But let's say he overdid it and he needs to make a correction. Like maybe turn left a little bit. What could he do? Take out the jetpack and throw the object. What would you do to him? Turn him to the side. On the new movie, Martian, right? What does he do at the end of the movie if you've seen it? He opens up a hole in his glove, and he does the whole Iron Man thing. When he flies, that makes sense because the air is escaping, so it creates thrust. It pushes him up. Are you with me? That's actually a really good physics movie. Everything is really cool in that. All right. But anyways, okay. What? Basically, you can just throw something. All right? Well, what should he? He should not throw his helmet. Right? That would be stupid. But he can throw the jackpack. All right. Now... What happens when two astronauts try to play a game of catch doing a spacewalk? So, me and... Hold on. They're just... By the way, you're laughing, but this has been done as an experiment in the, in the history of space travel, okay? So, me and Bianca are astronauts playing catch. Are you ready? So then I throw the ball at her, right? She throws the ball at me. And we're in a spacewalk. So we're in suits outside. What hap what's happening to us? We're getting further and further apart. Why? Because Every time I throw the ball, the ball throws me. The other thing too is that as soon as I do that force, I'm actually going to be, be thrown 
they're not gonna not gonna stop me until some some other force acts on it. So even as the ball is going towards her, I'm already going further and further and further and further. She's gonna have to throw it really hard to get it to me, and right? And then she's gonna be for eventually it's gonna be like you know hard to catch. What happened to those last girls? Yeah, they tried that. They had that. Oh, okay. <laughs> what happened to them? There. Good question. <laughs> they must still be playing it across the solar system. Here, catch that! <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, it puts another meaning to a home run, you know? All right, so, all right, hail Mary. Okay, okay, when you catch the ball, you feel a force in your hand. Why? So when I catch a ball, that was easy. Stefan, so I caught a ball. What's that force that I'm feeling? The mass of the ball. It's not the ball, it messes the ball. I caught a ball, right? Hold on, Stefan's question. So I caught a ball. Ow! It hurts my hand. Why? What force? That's not the force I'm feeling. Did the ball stop moving? Yes, it does. Why did it stop? Because, so what's the force you're feeling? No, it's not. Hold it. No, look at that. What stopped the ball? You did. What's the force you're feeling? The force. No, no, no. The ball stopped because you put a force on it. So what's the force you feel in your hand? The force you put on the ball. Do you not see that? When you punch someone, your hand hurts. Why? Because that's the force you cannot give without taking some. That's a bigger message there in the universe. When you give to others, you automatically get it back. Think about that. All right? So... Explain how horses are. This is mind bending for a lot of people. Okay? Mind bending for a lot of people. Carriage. Horse. Oh. How can the horse hold the carriage if the third law is a thing? Let's think about it. The horse acts, makes a force that acts on this thing, right? So that force of the horse pulling things forward pulls on the carriage. But by the third law, the carriage pulls back equally and opposite. Therefore, the, the carriage pulls the horse. How can the horse be moving forward? Yeah, yeah. Well, he already answered here, but you go ahead and say it. There's, we forget that there's more force on the horse. Exactly. There's friction with the horse on the floor. So the horse is exerting friction on the floor, right? And then he's be pushed forward. In fact, that's actually the other way around. The horse has more friction than the carriage. Actually, the horse's shoes have so much friction with the floor that, that this is confusing. People think that friction always slows you down. Is that true? Now, what makes me move is friction, isn't it? Because I push against the floor, the floor pushes back. Why is it so hard sometimes? You're trying to lift something, you just find yourself sliding. What do you need to do to get it, get, get it going? Change your shoes. More grip shoes. That's why workers wear those grip shoes. Right? Exactly. Because you need more, more traction. Right? Are you with me? With more traction. So as long as the horse's friction is bigger than the this friction, all right, it'll be fine. Isn't that cool? All right. So make sure you talk about Okay. Let's keep going. All right. I fire a rifle. All right. So I fire up Raymond. I just fired a rifle. And I feel a recoil. Why? Where's the recoil coming from? That, that natural gun. What do you mean? Okay, that force that's pushing you back. Where's that coming from? Yeah, I'm not shooting the gun. Uh, the gun's still here. What do you mean, shoot the gun? Shoot the bullet. Shoot the bullet. Okay. So, so you shoot the. You're actually calling. Me? Okay. When you shoot the bullet, right? Something propelled the bullet forward, an explosion. But by the same force that shot the bullet at that velocity, it must have shot the gun. Why does it seem like the gun is shooting the other direction very fast? Because you're holding it. And because it's more massive. So it doesn't go as fast as the bullet does. Are you with me? Because the bullet just you can't even see it. But the acceleration on the actual thing is not as big, otherwise it wouldn't be able to hold it. 
because you can't hold the bullet, right? But you can't hold the gun because the gun is not is more massive, so the so the acceleration in it is not so strict, right? Very clear on that. Okay, good. Um, is it possible for an object to stay at rest with a single force acting on it? There's only one force acting on it. Can, is it possible for the object to stay at rest? If there's a force acting on it, it's going to change its motion pattern. Are you with me? And if there's no, th how could you have a net force of zero with a force acting on it? One, only one acting on it. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. We didn't get to our mastery today, but it's okay because we, we did a lot of thinking. A student uses a plumb blob to verify that a door jam in a car is vertical. Okay, the car pulls. We really did this question, by the way. It's it's just a, a something that you hold to see if it's vertical. The, it's like a weight, and it, it will be vertical. You know what I'm saying? But anyways, he's using that, and then when the car stops, the plumb blob goes forward. We already talked about this. Why does it seem like that's breaking the lock? Because no force is acting on the car. The, the blob is not going forward. You're just not going fa as fast as you used to be going. Right? Right? You're not going as fast as you used to be going. So that means that you are slowing down. So there's friction acting on you, slowing you down. But there's no friction acting on the blob. So the blob keeps doing what it's doing. And it keeps going forward. Faster than you're going forward. Does that make sense? And so relative to your deceleration, the blob is going forward. But that's because you are accelerating. And it's the whole inertia frame of reference thing. Not inertia frame of reference thing we talked about. A 47 kilogram person steps on a scale in an elevator. Now, in newtons, if you uh, multiply it by 9.8, you get 461 newtons. Are you with me? So the scale is giving the person's real weight. What is the elevator doing? It must be stopped. All right? We're already getting to the next topic, though, which is the whole thing about apparent weight. But I'll go back to this next class. Now, is a force required to make an object move? So I see something moving. There must be a force acting on it. All right. As the question is stated, yes, you need a force to make it move. But let's say it's already moving. Do you need a force? No. no. So if, so if I see something moving, does that mean there's a force acting on it? No. So what does it mean that there's a force acting on it? When it's changing its motion pattern. Very good, Jennifer. Very good. All right. Now, very good. Now, um, compare the size of the force that acts on Earth with the force the moon acts. Uh, the, sorry, the moon acts on the moon. Uh, compare the force of the Earth on the moon with the force of the moon on the Earth. They are what? Equal and opposite. It's a reaction pair, right? I skipped this one, right? Sorry. Force and accelerations are both what? Vectors that point in what? Force and acceleration. Think about it. Same direction. Because F equals MA. M is a scalar. So all that M does, it changes the value of, of, the, of, of the vector. Right? But it will be the same thing. 18. Based on your answer for the question above, explain why there's a difference between the acceleration of the object. So the moon accelerates more than the Earth does. Why? Because of its? Friction. No, it's not friction. There's no friction in space. It's the mass. The Earth has a lot more mass. So it seems to accelerate less. Now, Hold on, people. If you double the force, what happens to acceleration if the mass stays constant? If you double the force, what happens to the acceleration? It doubles the acceleration. Very good. Can an object be moving in a direction opposite the direction of the force acting on it? Is it possible? Of course it is. It must be what? It must be slowing down. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, a mass of block M hangs from a string attached to a ceiling. An identical string hangs from the bottom of the block. This is super awesome. We'll start with this one next class, but I'll do these two really quick. Using dynamics explains why dog can shake off water off their fur. Why does that work? They shake it off and water goes flying away. Why? Because when they shake, they are putting in force on the water, right? But doesn't that mean water also puts a force on them? Sure, but why is it that the, the, the droplets go far and they don't? More mass. The dog is heavy. The, are you with me? The dog. All right, we'll, 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 
Next class, we'll finish this fruity cake and then also talk about a family. See you guys then. These two are really interesting. It's hard to think about them. These are the ones which are the hard questions on the test, these two. We'll talk about them next class. All right, cool. So you can give it to us next time.